Hi guys, welcome back to the So Food Podcast, a safe space where we talk about God, theology, the Bible and the Christian life in general. I'm your host, Noma. As most of you know, we are in the Lenten season. Lent is the period of 40 weekdays lasting from Ash Wednesday to Holy Saturday. Lent is a Christian observance leading up to Easter. And many Christians observe this season by fasting as a way to commemorate Jesus's fasting in the wilderness, like we are told about in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Similar to Christmas, the celebration of Easter has been commercialized. And as a result, many people are unaware of its religious origins and significance to the Christian faith. There are many non-Christians that choose to observe Easter by way of hunting for eggs, decorating baskets or exchanging Easter eggs, etc. while ignoring the religious aspects of the celebration. Don't get me wrong, I love a good Easter egg, so I'm not here to condemn chocolate. But contrary to these social practices, Easter marks the celebration of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. The earliest recorded observance of an Easter celebration comes from the second century. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, as recorded in the New Testament, is essentially the foundation upon which the Christian faith is built on. Still, this biblical doctrine is a highly debated topic, even within some Christian churches in modern times. Sadly, There are Christians today that deny the resurrection, much like the Sadducees of Jesus' day. So this is nothing new. The Apostle Paul was faced with a similar challenge during his time because some of the Corinthian Christians were being influenced by skeptics to doubt the reality of the bodily resurrection of Jesus, which was one of his main purposes for penning the epistle to them. And the reason why I mention this is because for today's episode, I will be teaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That will be our main text for today. Several other aspects of Christology, such as the birth of Jesus, his crucifixion, salvation, his second coming, etc. are regularly taught on in churches, which is good. But I think resurrection theology is often overlooked because it is a work attributed to the third person of the Holy Spirit, who is also oftentimes overlooked for example in Romans 8 11, it says if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you so right there in that verse for example we see that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a work that's attributed to the Holy Spirit yet many New Testament scriptures including our main text of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, attest to the fact that the gospel message of Jesus includes his life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension and second coming, which are commonly referred to as the essentials of the Christian faith. Saints, the resurrection of Jesus is not just only a historical event, but a theological truth and confession which has vast practical implications that are central to Christian worship, faith, life and practices. So in today's episode, I will expound on Paul's theological case, arguments and historical evidence presented in defence of the reality of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ laid out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as well as a few other supporting selected scriptures, its significance and practical implications. This will be a three-part series, so stay locked in. Before I begin, it's important to note that in several places in the New Testament, Jesus repeatedly predicted his own death and resurrection to his disciples. For example, in Mark chapter 9 from verse 30 to 31, it says, They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him and after three days he will rise. Other places where he predicted his own death includes Mark 10 
32 to 34, Mark 8, verse 31, John 2, verse 19, to name a few. So for us and the Christians at Corinth to be sure of Jesus' claim that he will rise from the dead, we must first believe that he died and was buried, right? Knowing this, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 presents four line of coherent arguments in defense of the reality of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Namely, number one, reinforcing the fact that Jesus died and was buried. Number two, the reliability of early eyewitness accounts of the risen Lord. Number three, the empty tomb church tradition. And number four, the practical implications of the resurrection for Christian life, liturgy and practices. Bearing in mind that Paul was a lawyer by profession, amongst other things, one thing that we are sure about is that he knew how to argue a case. And to ascertain the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, Paul's first piece of evidence that he presents is narrating the gospel message with the sole purpose of reaffirming the fact that Jesus died, was buried and raised from the dead in fulfilment of specific Old Testament prophecies such as found in Psalms 22, Isaiah 53 verse 9, Psalms 16 from verse 9 to 11, Hosea 6, 2 and Jonah 1, 17 to name a couple. Now I'm going to read Psalms 22 from verse 1 to 18 but you guys can read the rest of those other passages in your own time and it says my god my god why have you forsaken me why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning oh my god i cry by day but you do not answer and by night but i find no rest yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of israel in you our fathers trusted they trusted and you delivered them to you they cried and were rescued In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many balls encompass me, strong balls of bastion surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones, they stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lot. Interesting fact, guys, about Psalm 22 is that it was written by King David about a thousand years before crucifixions were even invented. So we see how jesus's resurrection and also his death were both prophesied about in that particular scripture and interesting fact again is the fact that jesus repeated those exact words in verse one my god my god why have you forsaken me eli eli lama sabachthani when he was hanging on the cross and the reason why he did that was to literally point out to those who were watching him be crucified and died that he is fulfilling that scripture that scripture is about him he might as well have said to them everyone turn your bibles to psalm 22 from verse 1 to 18 this is why in first corinthians 15 from verse 1 to 4 paul begins his line of argument with the following now Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved 
if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. In support of Paul's arguments regarding the confirmation of Jesus' death and burial, we have four key eyewitness accounts that all confirmed Jesus' death according to Mark's gospel, namely Pontius Pilate, the centurion that thrust the spear into Jesus' side, Joseph of Arimathea, and two female disciples of Jesus called Mary the mother of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. In Mark 15 from verse 39 to 47, it says, And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. This all happened on Friday, the day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath. As even approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, took a risk and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus had already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, he granted the body to be given to Joseph. Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth and laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were looking on to see where he was laid. End quote. Saints, if Jesus was not dead, the centurion would have notified Pontius Pilate when he was summoned and his corpse would not have been given to Joseph of Arimathea to bury as requested. Moreover, in Mark chapter 16 verse 1 records that early Sunday morning, roughly about 36 hours after Jesus' death and burial, the same Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph that observed where he was laid to rest went to his tomb to anoint him with spices that were used to embalm the dead, thereby further attesting to the confirmation of his death and burial. And it says in Mark 16 verse 1, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise. They were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? In addition, we also have the account of the Apostle John who witnessed Jesus' crucifixion from the beginning to the end and testified to the fact that he watched Jesus die as recorded in his gospel account precisely in John chapter 19 from verse 28 to 33, which says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture i thirst a jar full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth when jesus had received the sour wine he said it is finished and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the sabbath for the sabbath was a high day the jews asked pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead, so they did not break his legs. Historically speaking, Roman soldiers were torture and execution experts that practiced crucifixions for hundreds of years, and they had perfected the art of inflicting pain and suffering. But the fact that the Roman soldiers did not break Jesus' legs was totally uncharacteristic of the crucifixion. When the soldiers grew tired of watching their victims suffer and got bored with the situation, they would break your legs by taking a spear 
and swing it like a bat and hit the victim in the shins to break the shin bones. They would break the tibula and the fibula bones. Many times they would have to beat the legs for five or 10 minutes until they broke the shin bones because it takes a lot of force to achieve this. With the shin bones broken, the victim could no longer push up on the wooden block where the feet were nailed onto to breathe. It was common practice for Roman soldiers to break the legs of those they were crucifying as a way to cause suffocation so that death would occur quicker. This explains why after Jesus' death, the soldiers broke the legs of the two criminals that were crucified alongside him, like I read in John 19 verse 32. But seeing as Jesus was already dead when they went to check on him, they didn't need to break his legs. More so, we know that Jesus' bones were not going to get broken because the scriptures said in Psalm 34 verse 20, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken, which again is in line with Paul's argument here in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, because every aspect of Jesus' life was prophesied in the old testament including his crucifixion even down to the tiniest minutest detail instead the soldiers pierced his side like we're told in john chapter 19 verse 34 to assure that he was dead by doing this it was reported that blood and water came out from a medical and scientific perspective the blood and water that came out when the roman centurion thrust a spear into Jesus' side was a reference to the watery fluid that surrounds the heart and lungs. It is important to clarify that the spear wound was not the cause of Jesus' death. However, as the scriptures say, when the centurion saw that Jesus was already dead, he thrust a spear into his side. The water and blood that rushed out were medical indications that Jesus had died and was already dead. Even the Journal of the American Medical Association published a purely viewed scientific medical study of the evidence for the death of Jesus, which concluded that, quote, clearly the weight of the evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted, end quote. More accurately, the centurion's spear wound was done to confirm Jesus' death and also in fulfilment to another Old Testament prophecy in Zechariah 12.10, where the speaker Yahweh said, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Besides, guys, there is no record of anyone anywhere ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion and every biblical scholar agrees that historically it is undisputed that Jesus died. I found this video on YouTube on a channel called Unchained by Grace Ministries called Jesus' Suffering and Crucifixion, a Medical Point of View. It provides a more extended medical perspective on the crucifixion. For anyone who wants to check that out, I'll put the link in the description box that's all for today. Next week, I will cover Paul's second and third line of arguments, which are the reliability of early eyewitness accounts of the risen Lord and the empty tomb tradition. Then in part three, I will teach on what some of the practical implications of the resurrection are for Christian life, liturgy and practices. The Sofa podcast is available on all streaming platforms, so please feel free to share and subscribe. Thank you all for joining me again today. Until next time, peace and blessings.